So, I'm here to tell you about sort of the history and the growth of Southampton from a historical perspective. I've always loved history, and I had a, an epiphany when I was doing my A-levels. We had a new teacher, Mr. Gray, and he set us a project to do in the holidays. In the holidays, we were appalled, but he wanted us to research our own town in the Tudor period. It had never occurred to me that Southampton had a history. History was what happened elsewhere, kings and queens and battles, not what happened in the town where I lived. And when I started looking into it, I realised that Southampton had a rich history and that I wanted to study it more. So I was very fortunate when I went to university, I had three fantastic professors, Colin Platt, who did groundbreaking archaeology in the town, Tom James, who was really a, a great editor of the records series, looking at all the archives in Southampton, and uh, Professor Michael Hicks, who, who did lots of uh, detailed research projects. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about what I know about Southampton. And I'm focusing on what I call the heart of the town, where the town was founded, in the centre, by the Bargate, as was mentioned, and going down to the port, because it was always about the port, it's always about trade. That's why Southampton was here. I did a uh, presentation to ABP, Associated British Ports, uh, a few weeks ago, and they said, oh, Southampton's here because it's a port. We never realised. <laughs> they do now. And... I was going to show you a next picture, ah, here it is, about the Norman Conquest. So, Southampton was really, in its present state, founded because of the Normans who came over in that one date everyone knows, 1066. And it was, for them, it was all about conquest and the expression of power. So they built a whacking great castle right in the middle of the town to say that they were in control. But there were no stones in Southampton, so they had to ship it all in. And then they used that stone not only to build the castle, but the walls, the, the buildings that people lived in. And to do that, you had to have lots and lots of money. In the 15th and 16th centuries, towns started to become independent and it started to be um, a philosophical discussion about what a town was. And there were lots of writings that happened then by St Isidore and, and John Lydgate and perhaps the most well-known, Thomas More's Utopia. And it was about what makes a good town. And surprisingly, if you read these, it's about what people want now. They want law and order. They want uh, the bins to be emptied, the roads to be cleaned. And they want to be ha a place where they can work and crafts can grow. But also that there should be creativity and arts and entertainment. The other thing that towns did at this time was they liked to make a plot or a, a plan of what the town looked like. This isn't a very good image, but it was made in 1590, give them a break. Uh, but this is actually, uh, um, you can see this in the University of Southampton. It's the first surviving plan of the town of Southampton. Then you have to think about who founded your town. Now, most people, they, they looked back and they found a, a Saxon king or a saint. Southampton had a superhero. Sir Beavis, and Sir Beavis, he had a flying horse called Arundel. He had a magic sword called Mortglay, a glamorous wife called the Fair Josiah, and a giant companion called Ascupart. And the town, in order to tell this story, put big pictures of Beavis and Ascupart in the front of the bar gate. They still survive, they're tucked inside now and nobody can see them, and I think that's absolutely outrageous because they're a, a rare survival of this, this type of artwork. And Beavis was a text that was stu studied right up into the 19th century. It's been translated into Russian, Icelandic, you can see it all over the world. But it's almost forgotten in Southampton. But last year, somebody did a new translation of the original poem and even turned it into a, a comic book called Blood and Valour. So I'm hoping that people will start to um, remember the person who founded Southampton. At the end of the medieval and early modern period, Southampton had an economic decline and had to reinvent itself as a spa town. And uh, we went swimming uh, about where Marks and Spencer's is now. <laughs> and someone once said to me that they hadn't seen any uh, pictures or paintings of Southampton. I thought, well, go there in the 18th century, you're falling over artists. So it's not only people like Tobias Young and the Pethers and George Herriot, but also John Constable and J.M.W. Turner came to Southampton to draw and paint this rural idyll, this picturesque place in which people wanted to come and live. But 
Southampton's always about trade and money. And at the end of the spa period in the 19th century, it went back to its roots and also started to change beyond all recognition because up to that point, the town was contained still within its medieval walls. But they started to reclaim the land, so what we call the Eastern Docks was built. And then in the 1930s, they put a big boom across uh, where sort of all West Quay and all the, the cinemas and things are now. That was all water. And they pumped the water out and created what we call the New Docks. But in doing that, the people of Southampton lost their capacity to really um, interact with the sea and the water because the docks became a private enterprise and you couldn't get near to the water anymore. 20th century has not been kind to Southampton. So first of all, you had the slum clearances. You know, the buildings were quite run down, they'd been there 900 years, but now they would be considered grade one listed buildings, but then they were thought to be uh, places not fit for mod modern living. So most of the medieval town was swept away. Then in, the, um, in 1940, the Luftwaffe arrived, as if you didn't have enough problems, and they dropped 300 bombs and 8,000 incendiaries on the town over one weekend and really destroyed the centre of the town. The next thing that happened was that the town also started to break out not only of its walls but of its original boundaries and gobble up all the villages outside. So places like Wollstone and Millbrook and Portswood were originally different settlements with their own memories, their own histories, but they were grabbed into Southampton. And then you have the planners. So I always think that they probably did more damage to Southampton than the Luftwaffe in what they swept away in the 20th century. When I went to Rocklaura a few years ago, um, I was just amazed how beautiful the medieval town was. And then I was told it was fake because Rocklau had been even more devastated than Southampton in the Second World War. But they decided to take a different route in, in its rebuilding because the idea of all the destruction was to wipe the memory of Rocklau away. And the people who lived there didn't want that to happen. So they got out their old documents, they got the pictures and the paintings, and they reconstructed their whole town, their whole city. And you could say it's fake, or you could say it's them reclaiming their heritage and memory and saying this is not going to be destroyed, this is not going to be swept away, this is what we want our town to say. In Southampton, slightly different route. Uh, <laughs> So um, the, the picture you can see, the aerial view, is 1925. Lots of interesting buildings, Georgian buildings, medieval buildings, Victorian buildings. The picture in the centre is what happened, uh, what the town was like after 1940. Um, all the buildings are going up above bar were destroyed. And then the, the third picture is their idea of reconstruction. Now, there were um, restraints on what you could build and how high you could build and what materials you could use. So the centre of Southampton now uh, looks very low-key. I mean, it was all done in, in one period, so there is a, a, a oneness about it. But it's not as interesting, I don't think, as, as Rocklau. And you just think, well, surely they could have spent a bit more time and really thought about what Southampton could have been in the 21st century. However, all is not lost, because now we have got... Um, the, the town is growing again, we've got investment, we've got what's called 106 agreements, where you can get developers to pay money to enhance your landscape. In um, uh, an article in 2013, uh, Southampton was described as uh, the fourth <laughs> worst town in the list of crap towns. And um, this was probably because of, of what happened in that post-war rebuilding. I grew up in Southampton and I can remember, you know, six o'clock 
everything stopped. It's like tumbleweed going up the high street. Because all the people that had lived in the town before the war and who were moved out of the town during the war were not brought back afterwards. And so there weren't any people living there anymore. And so there, that heart, that centre of the town, that had been the centre of the town for a thousand years, had just really stopped beating. But who knows, what can we do in the 21st century? Student city. <laughs> I live right in the town centre. I feel like I live in the middle of a campus at the moment. Because uh, <laughs> every building that goes up is a, a student accommodation. God, when I was a student, there were six of us crammed in one room. I'm like, wonderful apartments. How can they afford it? Um, but they're all relatively bland buildings. They all look the same. You have these sort of pale colours and there's splashes of red or blue. Um, and then they all do that, that, that same recurring theme. And also, if you just build one type of accommodation, that then has an effect on the town that uh, develops around it. So again, the, the town centre is changing. Um, to, you know, high streets are suffering anyway, but you know, ordinary shops are disappearing. And I don't know how many cups of coffee people are drinking. <laughs> Every other uh, building is now a coffee shop. And in the evening, there's lots of sort of bars and entertainment. But it's a different town to what it was in past centuries. Why, uh, one of my favourite designers and architects is um, Gaudi, who worked in Barcelona. And I don't know, I expect most of you have been to Barcelona. I think he was probably slightly insane, but... To me, that's okay. And he, he, you know, he built these wonderful buildings and beautiful chimneys and a lot of things you can only see if you go up onto the, the roofs of buildings. And I, I think that if he turned up in Southampton and they, you know, he was pitching for an idea to, to, you know, to build a new West Quay uh, shopping centre, and he's like, yeah, I'm going to recycle materials and I'm going to use ceramics and colour. And they're like, yeah, but can you do it in the shape of a ship? Because every, every building uh, in Southampton is supposed to look like a, a liner. Um, but, but in Barcelona, I, I mean, not everybody loved what he, he did. And there are lots of um, insults that were, were levelled at him. But the one I really like is he was accused of being excessively imaginative. <laughs> And I, I would love that. I would love that insult. And I would love Southampton to be insulted in a way like this. Uh, we're in a, a beautiful new cultural complex now. And it, it's fantastic, all the artwork and all, all the creativity that's, that's going on inside these buildings. But it's interesting that when they opened, you know, what The Guardian lamented was the, the design of the external buildings and that they were quite boring. And so I hope that going forward in the 21st century that people in, in Southampton can demand more creativity, more individuality and some iconic buildings in the town so that we can really celebrate our history and our heritage and also the future through the design and growth of the town uh, in this century and to be excessively imaginative. Thank you.